our great privilege to hear and speak, so please help me in welcoming Dr. Tom Palmer. Well, I hope that everyone can hear me. Am I mic'd up properly? Okay, very good. Well, thank you for that very warm, overly warm and generous introduction. Uh, I should say about uh, Dr. Levader, it was actually his interest in philosophy. Uh, I encouraged him to go into medicine so he could say he met a physician. <laughs> but uh, I will talk a little bit about um, Mises at the beginning. I'll have more substantive things to say. Most of this will be a little bit of history, a little bit of economic theory, so I'll go slow for Lydia and the other <laughs> economists here. Uh, <laughs> Mises was very important to me personally. I do not remember his birthday particularly, but I do remember the day he died, October 10, 1973. I was at a libertarian meeting that we had organized at the university, and Dr. John Hospers, who was chairman of the philosophy faculty at University of Southern California and others were there and we heard it on the radio. So it was a rather somber, unpleasant uh, meeting and people talking about the loss of such a great giant, but he was an inspiration nonetheless. Uh, I also had the privilege of arranging for his books to be translated into many other languages. So in Russian and Czech and other languages, uh, when I worked behind the Iron Curtain. I'll talk about that a little bit more. <clears throat> so the first point is people forget how rapid the transformation was. We think about the fall of the Berlin Wall and how surprised many people were by it, most notably the communists. <laughs> so just before the wall, Eric Conacher, who was the general secretary of the Socialist Unity Party of the German Democratic Republic, that is to say, the Communist Party. He said, the wall will be standing in 50 and even 100 years. This is January of 1989. He said, just before, he said, and this uh, rhymes very nicely in German, neither an ox nor a donkey is able to stop the progress of socialism. <laughs> So it was destined to be there forever. The wall was celebrated as a triumph of socialism. So we see here 1986, the 25th anniversary of the anti-fascist protective wall, <laughs> which is what they called it. This was the wall to protect them uh, from the fascists. This was a great uh, victory there. Uh, participants, 1987, those who participated in the construction of the wall were hailed as heroes of the German Democratic Republic. We see again October 7, 1989, the 40th anniversary of the foundation of the German Democratic Republic, massive military parades, long live the German Democratic Republic, our socialist fatherland was celebrated. So this is October 7th, 1989. Massive parades celebrating the triumphs of socialism. At the same time though, for the first time since 1953, there were demonstrations. These are plainclothes policemen, uh, in this case arresting people. They mingled in the crowds and beat people and uh, dragged them out. Uh, occupied the Stasi, Staatssicherheit, the state security officers, occupied the Stasi building immediately, people demanding this outside. And for the first time, Honecker and others heard people chanting against them. It was a real shock to them on that moment when they could hear people chanting against communism. And this was seen throughout uh, People who lie are not believed uh, until they actually break the lie, also when they speak otherwise. And it's hard to translate it into English, it rhymes in German. But it means we won't believe all your lies until you stop doing what you're doing to us. So 
So this was the first time there were these public manifestations against it. And it was a real shock to the authorities. Eric Honecker on this uh, 7th of October uh, parade. And then very shortly thereafter, on the 18th of October, he was forced to resign as General Secretary of the Communist Party and replaced by the equally loathsome and despicable Egon Krenz, who was considered marginally less hated than Honecker was. <coughs> and Krenz presided over what became the dissolution of communism in Eastern Germany. So we went from this, this famous image of the soldier uh, escaping, running over the barbed wire while he still could before it was turned into a wall. Uh, Peter Fecht, who was murdered and bled to death right next to the wall. Uh, no one would, uh, would help him. To this, and I'd like to share a little video I made of a friend in Bishkek, which is uh, the capital of Kyrgyzstan, formerly the Kyrgyz Soviet Socialist Republic, with a dear friend of mine. I made it with a little uh, handheld camera. Oops, go back. How to make this work? My name is Sacha Tan. I'm currently living in Moscow, but I was born in East Germany in the so called German Democratic Republic. Today is October 7th, 2009. Exactly 20 years ago, the officials of East Germany, of the German Democratic Republic, were celebrating the birthday of East Germany, the National Day. And we, as students, in the beautiful town of Dresden, could not even imagine that only one month later the wall would come down. And I would like to tell you my personal story of November 9th, 1989. I was in Dresden, and still in the morning, in the early morning, and then I went to Berlin by train. And when I came home, my mother asked me, do you want to go to West Berlin? And I said, yeah, sure, I want to go, but it will come next year, after two years, whenever, and then I will go. And she said, switch on the TV. And I switched on the TV and could see the live coverage of Rias TV, which was a West Berlin TV station, from all the checkpoints where the East Germans went to West Berlin. And I had an opportunity to a police office because we all thought that we need some stamp in our IDs, in our so-called Casamalos language, which every East German used to have. Later on, I got the stamp and went to a checkpoint at the S-Bahn Friedrichstraße, and nobody wanted even to see or to control our stamps and our ID. So then I entered the train, the suburban train, and after 10 minutes I was in the western part of Berlin. Yeah, and I was first time, was first time in my life that I was in the so-called West. And it was my first experience with individual freedom. And now, 20 years later, I work for the Friedrich Norman Foundation, which promotes freedom, individual freedom all over the world in Moscow. So that, yeah, he's a quite remarkable friend of liberty. <laughs> and the point was how shocked he was. He went home from university and his mother said in the morning, would you like to go to West Berlin? Yeah, well, of course, I'd like to go to the moon, too. <laughs> and she says, just turn on the TV. And people were doing it. It was really astonishing how rapidly this totalitarian police state crumbled when people realized the power that they had. And if you see the images, when they began to surge across the barricades, because there was a rumor that they were getting rid of the restrictions. People came to the wall and the soldiers didn't know what to do. And they're just overwhelmed. People just put up the barricades and walked across. 
was really a shock uh, to the state. So how did it happen? Well, I'll talk about that, but first a little bit of autobiography and why I became interested in this. So I had uh, spent some time uh, in Berlin, it was uh, some years ago, when the wall was still standing. This is maybe 1984, when I had uh, gone to Berlin. A couple of pictures that I took, the no man's land with the automatic machine guns, the constant patrols, the dogs, uh, the mines, and as I said, automatic machine guns. If you tripped it, you were sprayed with machine gun fire. It was literally a no man's land. Also in the rivers, uh, in the Spree River, uh, underground uh, devices to skewer you. If you tried to swim across, you would be impaled on them. So this is quite ferocious. Picture that I took, there was all around where people had been murdered. Heinz Sokolowski, 48 years old, East Berlin, died, killed. On uh, November 25, 1965, after seven years of imprisonment in the German Democratic Republic, shot while fleeing. And this was to commemorate him. This made a big impact on me, just something I found in an old box uh, not too long ago when I had lunch in the Palace of the Republic, fortunately now destroyed, one of the most hideous, ugly buildings uh, in the history of humanity. I had a beer and a trout for 12 <laughs> Mark 70 in my transit visa from the German Democratic Republic. And someone took a picture of me expressing my opinion at the time uh, of the wall. So that was uh, not as articulate as Ludwig von Mises, but uh, direct. <clears throat> well, a few years later, it occurred to me and some others this system is going to collapse. I have to say, not many people thought that. So I was not the only one. But a few people said, this system is going to collapse. It will not continue. And it's going to matter a great deal what replaces it. Because just to be frank, you can do worse than what they had in the German Democratic Republic in 1989. And there are countries of the former Soviet Union that have shown that. Uzbekistan, Turkmenistan, Tajikistan during their civil war, over 100,000 people killed, and so on. So you can do worse. You need to have the right ideas and understanding of a free society to build free societies after the collapse of this horror. So I moved to Eastern Europe. Uh, this was someplace, I forget what city that was. Uh, with a very cold winter, my Ludenmantel. Um, spent time uh, promoting the ideas of liberty. This is the Karl Marx University in Budapest. And uh, something I found also not too long ago, giving a lecture on Hayek's The Fatal Conceit. So this was from November 21, 1989. Uh, <clears throat> I was invited to give lectures during the revolution in Prague. And uh, so this was an old picture there. And I learned something also. Uh, this was a red stamp, didn't come out when I had it scanned. I always saved all official documents from communist states. And I learned if it had a red stamp, it had a mesmerizing impact on officialdom. And when I would be arrested or stopped, I would take out these documents, even if they were kind of old, and say, I have an official invitation from the Academy of Sciences of the Union of Soviet Socialist Republics. And I think the comrade will be very disappointed if I continue to be delayed. <laughs> <laughs> and they'd say, why do you have two photocopying machines and 5,000 sheets of paper? I always travel <laughs> with two photocopying machines. I say, I have been invited to give lectures at Moscow State University. I have to deliver my lectures and I have to have notes for the students. There are no photocopying machines at the university. How am I to do this? And they would finally just say, I don't want to end up on the Tajik Afghan border. <laughs> so we'll just go, <laughs> just, just go. And these red stamps were very, very powerful. 
uh, for officialdom. So I kept all of those for a very long time. <coughs> when I was living in Vienna, where my office was, just again, I found these in a box uh, not too long ago. This is from Der Standard, East and West Berlin, celebrate or party together, you could really put it party. Uh, the uh, uh, German Democratic Republic border guards are, are pulling down the wall. This is a, a great, great day to be able to see this and people gathering before the Brandenburger Tor and celebrating. And then the day when the border with Hungary was finally cut and completely opened. And here Jula Horn um, uh, coming to the border, the Hungarian foreign minister and the soldiers were pulled back from the border, so there were no more soldiers on the Hungarian-Austrian uh, border. This was really momentous because these borders were terrifying and many people were killed uh, trying to cross over them. Well, somehow I got hooked on this. Uh, it was uh, my calling, uh, what I like to do. So this kind of work that I do, I tend when I'm in Afghanistan, I don't wear these kind of clothes. I have a strong aversion to being beheaded. <laughs> and I have an advantage. I look like a um, Nuristani. And the Nuristanis happen to be among the most uh, warlike and dangerous people in Afghanistan. <laughs> And so this has some advantages when I've been pulled over and I don't talk because I don't speak Dari. And the soldiers will come over and they'll say, these people are Nuristanis, do not mess with them. And then we just keep driving on. <laughs> so that's quite useful. This was in Nepal with our fantastic libertarian team. By the way, the previous group, some of our libertarian friends in Afghanistan, extremely brave uh, and very principled uh, people who stand up for liberty in Nepal where they were able to outlast and contribute to the defeat of communism in that country. If you may know, Nepal had a two-thirds communist majority, the majority of whom were Maoists, the most psychotic, if you will, <laughs> uh, of the communists <coughs> in the Nepali parliament. And they worked tirelessly to educate people about the importance of property rights, of markets, of exchange, and they won. And the communists were finally turfed out. And now they have a, a more reform-oriented, more or less moderate government in Nepal with whom they work very, very closely, the Sam Brady Foundation of Nepal. Uh, this is in uh, Poland, where we have many uh, partners. I'm often in Poland. Afghanistan again, that's my normal work clothes. <laughs> this was uh, Nigeria, Zari University, it's me in the middle here uh, with the uh, deans. <coughs> uh, and this was uh, on a trip to uh, the Democratic People's Republic of Korea, which is a country, it is the saddest place I've ever been in all my life. It's, it's really terrible, terrible place. But we work uh, quite extensively with North Korean refugees and participate in a variety of projects that I can't really describe to help people in that country to have some access to knowledge about the world because it is a terribly closed and <coughs> profoundly oppressed society. Now, some theses on Mises. I want to run through a few things that I think are worth sharing. So. What about Ludwig von Mises? Where does he fit into this story of socialism and its collapse? <coughs> His role was important. He identified a very important flaw in socialism. I'll talk about the nature of his critique, uh, how it's often misunderstood. That's important because you hear even people friendly to it get it wrong in important ways. Uh, his critique was not the cause of the collapse. And I want to talk about what caused the collapse of communism. Mises helps us to understand it, but his explanation did not contribute to it taking place. <clears throat> the logic of dissolution, of what happened with socialism, how it fell to pieces. And then fifth, I'll just talk about some challenges we still face, and Mises still offers us some thoughts on how to meet them. 
So if you're interested, all of his books are now available online. If you're old-fashioned like me, you can read them in these dead trees <laughs> with ink on them. Uh, but the Online Library of Liberty has a fabulous collection. They're all available in many different formats, and Liberty Fund has reprinted them in quality, affordable uh, editions that uh, young people also can't afford. So first, his critique. In 1920, he issued a challenge to the socialists. And I want to mention uh, for a moment why this is important. The socialists were coming to power, now, first in Russia, and then there were also Soviet republics being established in Hungary, in uh, Bavaria, in Berlin, and so on. These were largely uh, defeated, but it looked like this was going to be spreading all over, not only in Russia, but in other parts of Europe as well. Marx had systematically avoided any discussion of what communism would be like. The reason is, it's inevitable. If it's inevitable, if it has to happen, why waste our time talking about how it's going to work? It'll work. And Mises pointed out, well, that's a pretty good dodge. <laughs> but he said, I want to ask, these people are now in power, what are they going to do? How will the butter be prepared? How will stuff be made? How's it going to work? You can't put it off anymore. They're in power. What's their plan and their proposal? What are they going to do? This was a very powerful challenge. And the key was, as he said, that valuation can only take place in terms of units. Seven units, 12 units. We know 12 is bigger than seven. We know 16 is twice eight. That's very important if you're going to calculate particularly if you're going to have to compare costs in alternative uses of resources or speakers and music, to take another example. <laughs> but he said it is impossible that there should ever be a unit of subjective use value for goods. Some people like wine, some people like beer, some people don't drink alcohol at all. So in what way can we compare their valuation of wine or beer or other drinks? They have their own subjective preferences in these matters. Judgments of value do not measure. They merely establish grades and scales. You like this more than that because you picked this over that, but how much more did you like it? We can't say. There's no way to say I liked it 1.3 times as much or 1.9 times as much. All we can say is more and less, preferred and not preferred. That's all we can talk about in a systematic, scientific way. Now, his critique is often misunderstood. People say, well, look, all he meant was you needed really strong, powerful computers to solve the problems. That's not what he was talking about. You can have all the computers in the world and you cannot solve the problem. The problem is the problem of economic valuation. I'll take a very simple example. The wiring in the lighting is probably made of copper. Ask an electrical engineer, what is a better conductor of electricity? So we ask our physics friends, they say, well, you know, if you use gold, it'll have less resistance. You won't have all that energy being lost in the form of heat that's radiated. So we should use gold in all the wires. But I'll bet, even in all the communist states, if you looked at the wiring, it wasn't made of gold. Although they joked about it that in the future gold would be used to make toilets and so on, because who needs precious metals in an advanced socialist economy? They didn't do that. And the reason is the cost. The cost. Gold has opportunity cost. There's not much of it. So we use it for jewelry and fillings and very high-valued electronics gear and your hi-fi set and so on. We don't use it just to carry electrical power to, for lighting. But how do we know? The engineer tells us use gold. That's the engineering solution. But there's an economic problem. That is to say, gold and copper have all these alternative uses. 
How do we know which one to use for which purpose? That's an economic question, not an engineering question. And he said, that's what we should be focusing on. What's the cost of the use of it? The alternative use. How would we know what is the lowest cost means of doing this? Now, some people say, well, you just have to get the prices right. We understand, we understand, Ludwig, that you need prices. Well, we'll just create the right prices through socialism. Oscar Lange argued, we'll create socialist companies staffed by government employees and we'll tell them to act as if they were maximizing profits and set the prices at the level it would be to maximize the profit. That would be one solution. The other, the very brilliant uh, Soviet mathematician Leonid Kantorovich, developer, one of the great developers of linear programming, said, we can solve this, it's a math problem, to create the optimal set of prices. We can do it, it's just a math problem. We can create the right prices so that all prices will be equal to marginal costs. But well, Mises hinted at the nature of the problem in his 1920 essay. The world changes. And these alternative approaches cannot take that into account. As he said, and this is a very interesting description of what the Soviet economy turned into. He wrote it quite early on, before there was much of a Soviet economy. For a time, the remembrance of the experiences gained in a competitive economy which has obtained for some thousands of years, may provide a check to the complete collapse of the art of economy or management. <clears throat> Yet in place of the economy of the anarchic method, Karl Marx had accused capitalism of being anarchistic, it was unplanned, of production, recourse will be had to the senseless output of an absurd apparatus. The wheels will turn, but will run to no effect so that the Soviet system continued to churn on but became increasingly irrational and increasingly unconnected with satisfying any human wants. In 1922, he brought out his big book, translated into English as Socialism, which has all kinds of other ideas also, in sociology and history. It's a very, very rich, uh, interesting treatment the problem of economic calculation is a problem which arises in an economy which is perpetually subject to change. An economy which every day is confronted with new problems which have to be solved. So if you're just gonna do the same thing over and over, do what you used to do under capitalism and it'll more or less work. Except the world will change. And continuing to do that old thing will become increasingly disconnected from the world of human desires and the facts and realities of what we would call supply and demand, availability of resources. Now, even some pro-market economists who tried to grapple with the idea of change failed to see the problem. Joseph Schumpeter, whom I greatly admire, I think he's an underappreciated economist in his work on a dynamic create uh, creative destruction, as he put it, is very, very important. Even he thought that all you needed to do was figure out the optimal prices. And as he said, <clears throat> the theorist, this follows, namely that you can satisfy the most human wants, follows from the elementary proposition that consumers in evaluating or demanding consumers' goods, ipso facto, that by that fact, also evaluate the means of production which enter into the production of those goods. In other words, here's the question. Why is iron ore worth something? Have you ever had any? Anyone ever eaten a bowl of iron ore? No. What do you do with iron ore? You make iron with it. What do you do with iron? You make stuff with it. Iron things. Like irons. <laughs> stuff like that. The value of the iron ore is determined, it's imputed, by the value of the iron. 
which really is determined by the value of your ironed shirts, the services that it generates for you. Now, Hayek responded, and there's a, it's a very sharp response in 1945 to Schumpeter's 1942 statement that, yeah, socialism can work. I should point out, Schumpeter was not a socialist. He found socialism a depressing prospect. He didn't like it. But he thought, yeah, they can do it if they get these smart mathematicians. It'll just be oppressive and horrible. But they can do it. So he wasn't a communist or a socialist. But he thought it was possible to solve the problem. And Hayek said, you have confused logical implication with value imputation. It's a little technical. This is about the most technical part of what I'm going to talk about. The starting point derived from Karl Menger, who's often considered the, considered the first of the Austrian economists, the value of inputs are imputed from the value of the outputs. As I mentioned, the iron you use to iron your shirts, it derives its value from the fact that we like having iron shirts that aren't covered with wrinkles. And the iron that went into making the iron derives its value from that, all the way back to the iron ore, and then the resources needed to dig the ore and process it comes from the imputation of value from what we actually consume, from our demand. Now, it's common among everyday people today and among the classical economists to believe that cost determines price. Right? You spend a lot of time on it, so therefore the price will be high. Anyone in business usually knows that it doesn't work that way. <laughs> you can't make people buy your stuff just because you worked hard on it. <laughs> it turns out it's the price you anticipate selling it for that will determine the costs you're willing to undergo to produce it. It's very counterintuitive. It really makes you think it's price that determines cost, not cost that determines price. That is a thought that it kind of hurts to think it. <laughs> it. It can't be right. But it's the right way to think about these issues. So starting from that, this idea that value of producer goods is imputed to them from the value of the consumer goods, the things we consume. Or to be more accurate, the services they render to us. The crisp, clean shirts and the pleasure that we have in that. That's ultimately the source of the value. Well, here's what Hayek said, and this is, these are fighting words among Austrian economists. But I'm going to go through it. As I said, this is the most technical part of this presentation. But it's actually pretty important to understand what was involved. Taken literally, Schumpeter's statement is simply untrue. This is, this is strong. The consumers do nothing of the kind. What Professor Schumpeter's ipso facto, that is to say by that very fact, presumably means is that the valuation of the factors of production, the iron ore and the mining equipment and all that, is implied in or flows necessarily from the valuation of consumers' goods. This too is not correct. Very clear, as I said, this is fighting language for Nobel Prize winners. <laughs> Implication is a logical relationship which can be meaningfully asserted only of propositions simultaneously presented to one and the same mind. The point Schumpeter was making was set the prices of the consumer goods and then you can just simultaneously determine the prices of all of the producer goods. They're implied like logical implication. If I say this statement implies that one, it's true at the same time the first statement is true, simultaneously and present to one mind. It is evident, however, that the values of the factors of production do not depend solely on the valuation of the consumer's goods, but also on the conditions of supply of the various factors of production. So it's not just the fact you like coffee that implies the value of the coffee beans and the coffee plants 
and the little coffee harvesting machines and the coffee fertilizer and all the things necessary to make your coffee. That's not true at all. There's this other side, the supply side, only to a mind which all these facts will simultaneously know would the answer necessarily follow from the facts given to it. That's not the world. There is no one mind of the human race that knows all of these things such that one thing could be logically implied by another. Prices are not implied logically. This is Schumpeter's key mistake and the mistake of the attempts of Soviet planners who followed this model also. And they really did. Many of them really believed they could get it right in the late 40s, 50s, and through the 60s. The practical problem, which was Hayek's concern, arises precisely because these facts are never so given to a single mind. Right? Look at all the minds that are in this room. You all know things none of the rest of us know. Every single one of you knows stuff unique to you. Nobody else knows it. Where all your stuff is in your house, to take an obvious example. And because in consequence it is necessary that in the solution of the problem, knowledge should be used that is dispersed among many people. That's the economic problem. And it is the problem that linear programming cannot solve. Although linear programming is a very useful tool in logistics and many other um, activities, really helpful. But it cannot solve the economic problem. The economic problem requires those prices. Prices that are established in the messy higgling and haggling of the market. Of going in and offering less and the other, the merchant wants more and you come to a price you can agree on. Now doing so, you engage in what is called non-tuistic interaction. That's a horrible term that no human being should ever use. <laughs> and I'll explain what it means. It's hard to describe this in our normal language. The socialists say markets make you selfish. They're about selfishness or greed. Why? Because every time you go to the store, you want the lower price. You're bastards. You're bad. <laughs> you always want the greedy lower price. And the merchant, what does the merchant want? The most that they can get. It's all greedy, 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 greedy. There's an essay that I commission, of which I commissioned the translation, this little book you can get by a Chinese professor, Mao Yushu, and it's in this little book, The Morality of Capitalism. And he explains this so beautifully in a Chinese context drawing on Chinese literature and traditions. He describes a great Chinese novel of the land of gentlemen. And in the land of gentlemen, no one seeks his or her own profit, only the profit and benefit of others. It's made up of nice people, like socialists would like us to be. In this world, in that country, when you go into the store, you say, how much is this? It's beautiful. And the merchant says, that will be a hundred dollars. You say, for this a hundred dollars? I would not pay less than 150. <laughs> to which the merchant says, oh please, sir, look, it's old and broken. I will not take more than 70. Seventy dollars, you insult me. I insist on paying 300 for this. 300, sir. It would be robbery. 10. <laughs> now you notice what it means is we can never agree. We cannot come to an agreement that will be mutually beneficial. It is not possible. But instead, if I, the merchant, if I, the customer, seek the lowest price and you, the seller, seek the highest, we can, in principle, come to some point that will be beneficial to both of us. But we cannot in a world in which I do not seek my own interest and you do not seek yours. Now notice though, it doesn't mean I'm being selfish. Why? I wanted to buy the watch to give to someone. I wanted to buy blankets 
to take care of people who are cold and suffering. I wanted to buy medicine to send to a hospital for the indigent to help them be cured of illnesses. I wasn't being selfish. I still want the lowest price. I want to keep the most people warm or to cure the, most sick num the highest number of sick people for my money. I'm not selfish. I'm non-tuistic, which means when I interact with you, I'm not seeking your advantage. I'm seeking to advance my goals. And if you're seeking to advance yours, we can, in principle, come to a mutually beneficial agreement. So markets make it possible for us to generate those prices. And the prices, in the case of, consumer go of producer goods, give us the proxy for cost. I now know when I'm the electrical uh, contractor for the building and I go to the market, I say, well, I really, really want gold wiring for this building. I want it to be a really fine building and lower their electricity costs. So I'm gonna use gold wire until I find out that will cost $11.5 million <laughs> to use gold wire. And we'll save them $600 a year in electrical costs. Okay. Or I could come in and for $60,000 wire it with copper and electrical bill will be $600 higher. Do the math. But what's important is the only reason we can do the math is because of prices. And prices require markets in those capital goods. This is what the mathematical economists, including Schumpeter, who should have known better, did not grasp. Now, the command economies floundered, and the problem that Mises identified just got worse and worse and worse. As again, his point about the wheels turning, but to no effect. So, here's a shocking thing I want to share with you. Many people believe there was a big debate between capitalism and socialism. And capitalism won. That debate did not happen. There was no debate. That's not why socialism collapsed. We would like to take credit for that. We would like to say because we went out and did all that work and talked about capitalism, socialism went away. That's just not true. It makes us feel good about it, that somehow we won a debate. The debate did not happen. It's actually pretty simple. One side ran out of money. <laughs> Essentially what happened. And that system collapsed. Now, the Soviet state abolished markets and prices and consumer goods. They initially tried to abolish all money during the period of so-called war communism. That was such a catastrophe, they quickly retreated from that and reinstituted money for consumer goods and money wages, rather than just being able to go down and say, I'm hungry now, feed me. You got paid money and you had to go and buy food in the state stores or go to state restaurants and so on. So they re-monetized the economy, but not the capital markets not the markets for producers' goods. So the system worked in a way, but it was a very interesting thing to study. It was not central planning as it is normally understood. It's a system called, a very uh, robust Russian word, blot. <laughs> it's kind of hard to translate. And what it meant was, a very complex system of indirect exchange. You're the manager of a tractor factory. You're told to produce 2,000 tractors. That's your quota. You're going to get all the stuff needed to produce tractors, except it doesn't arrive. Some of it does and not all of it. What are you gonna do about it? You need ball bearings. You don't have any ball bearings. You can't roll the tractors out without the ball bearings. So what do you do? Well, you call the ball bearing factory, you say, where are the ball bearings? We're supposed to get ball bearings. Sergei, sorry, 
No ball bearings. They say, well, but I have to have them. He says, I don't have them. So he says, what do you have? He says, maybe I could help with ball bearings, maybe. But I need something. I don't have any motor oil. So, do you have any motor oil? If he does, it's problem solved. But he probably doesn't. So he keeps a ledger of all the things he needs and he finds out what other people have and what they need. And eventually he might be able to make a very complex trade of motor oil for medicine for boots for some hookers, <laughs> and my, I'm just being blunt, for this, for that, for the other thing, for the thing he wants. So he can meet the quota, be promoted, get capital investment from the central authorities, and so on. It's a kind of a market. It's a really primitive, cumbersome, inefficient market. And there were people, tolkachi means pushers. Not so much like drug pusher, but a better term would be fixers. They fix things. And they do it in exchange for favors. These people were hated, they were denounced as speculators, often beaten, savagely abused. They were still pretty powerful guys. And one thing was interesting, money didn't matter. You couldn't buy anything with money. They dealt in favors. Favors and stuff, access to a dacha, access to a Black Sea a sanatorium, access to medical care, all of those things. Without them, the system would have completely collapsed. They're the ones, and they were generally quite hated by everyone who despised them, who made the system kind of grind along. And this very complex form of indirect exchange, where because there's no money exchanging hands, there were multiple different kinds of rubles, but they were not mutually convertible. You couldn't trade one into another kind. They were accounting fictions, rubles for trading in the Comic-Con countries, uh, and so on. So you had this non-monetized system of complex change of exchange, uh, chains of exchange dealing in favors of various kinds. And it kind of ground forward and kind of delivered some of the goods. Now, the Soviets followed Lenin and his reading of Marx and of recent economic history. And here's what they derive from this. Value is produced in factories. The place you produce value is big stinky places that make clanking sounds and produce smoke. <laughs> That's where you make value. The industrial proletariat, the new class of the future, and they looked at German history, said Germany has many factories producing concrete and steel and chemicals. If we produce factories <coughs> producing concrete and steel and chemicals, we will be rich also. This is what many socialist regimes did. They transferred value from agriculture to factories. And you know the, the terror famine they lowered the living standards among the peasants from a very low standard to starvation. Millions of people died. The grain was requisitioned during collectivization and sold abroad. And read the accounts, they're horrific, unbelievable suffering. Deliberate starvation of people <coughs> to generate foreign currency earnings to buy machines to build factories. These factories produce steel and cement. In order to produce more factories, making steel and cement, that steel and cement was used to create factories creating steel and cement. This is what Michael Polanyi called the system of conspicuous production. <laughs> the huge amounts of activity producing something of virtually no value. It's also why the CIA and Paul Samuelson, who got the Nobel Prize, 
thought economic growth in the Soviet Union was much higher than in the US year after year after year. In fact, in the last year of the USSR's existence, Samuelson's textbook said they continue to outproduce the US. And he just kept moving forward the point at which they would surpass per capita GDP in the US. What, mis what mistake was he making? He was measuring the outputs of steel and cement, which I love, by the way. I love steel and cement. I use it every day. It's one of the most valuable things in my life. My life is better because of steel and cement. That's what they were measuring. The CIA and Paul Samuelson and many others thought they had a higher rate of economic growth because they were generating what was in reality massive, massive waste and destruction of value. Now, there were big advances in science and technology. We shouldn't forget that. Brilliant scientists working at the Soviet Union, sometimes even in slave labor camps. That is really puzzling. They designed Soviet aircraft in labor camps, which is kind of weird to think, why would they do that? And I think being tortured was also an incentive to say, yes, comrade, we'll make a better airplane for you. And there were also great advances in the theoretical sciences, in physics, optics, and elsewhere. Not so much in applied things such as chemistry, because chemical experiments require having very pure solutions. So you can say this is exactly 0.005% such and such, and they couldn't produce that. But anything theoretical and math mathematical, they really did uh, uh, remarkably well. The vast bulk of that went into military production, not consumer goods. The percentage of the Soviet GDP that went into the production of weapons was staggering. We do not even now know exactly how much it was, but it was huge. The thing that came second was the production of tiny communist pins, <laughs> which you could get just boxes of them. Every time I go to the Soviet Union, I bring back boxes of these little medals and pins celebrating the uh, great Soviet victory in tractor production from 1952 and so on. Uh, those goods, though, were used to cement the hold of the Soviet Union over its empire. But what was remarkable is every country added to the empire made it more difficult to sustain. Eastern Europe, Cuba, Cuba was a gigantic drain on the Soviet Empire, as was Vietnam. So these, as they're extending their empire, they were becoming increasingly impoverished. Agricultural production fell quite dramatically. Food production was quite low towards the end of the Soviet Union, and they were importing vast amounts of food from abroad. What was it that kept them staggering forward? Oil and gas from Siberia very inefficiently exploited. And the Western engineers who went there just were staggered. In order to meet the quotas, they were pumping water into the ground rapidly, diminishing the ability to extract oil from that field in future, but allowing them to meet this year's quota, because that was what was going to get you advanced, <coughs> rewarded, or punished. They made good wireless microphones, comrade. Yeah. <laughs> no doubt. <coughs> So central planning was ultimately unable to deal with this problem of change, changing technology, changing population. Now let's look at some of the elements in which the communist system dissolved. It wasn't just that it fell overnight, and it wasn't that people just got tired of it. There was a process. Gorbachev came to power in 1985 and was famous for the statement, we cannot go on living like this. But it was not clear what he had in mind. It's a statement he made to Edward Shevardnadze, and his wife, Raisa, also reported it in her memoirs. We cannot go on living like this. But he was a confirmed Leninist. All of his speeches from the period keep saying, we must return to Lenin's original idea. We must return to our core principles. We must fulfill Lenin's idea of the Soviet Union. That the problem was they had strayed from the true Leninist path. 
And he had three slogans. Acceleration, which didn't mean anything. <laughs> Not, nothing happened, we should accelerate everything. Stalin used to call this the five-year plan in four. So we had a five-year plan and we will achieve the goals of the five-year plan in four years. So this was essentially meaningless. It meant work harder or else. <coughs> Openness, glasnost. This did begin something that led to an unraveling when people began to discuss these things. Larisa Piasheva wrote some of the early articles on new models of socialist management procedures, i.e. capitalism. <laughs> but she couldn't say that, but she was able to float these ideas and to say maybe we should have real autonomy of the firms and maybe there should be someone who would benefit if it does a good job. Not an owner, we're against that, but a residual claimant perhaps. <laughs> someone who would reap the difference between what it cost and what it was sold for. And then perestroika or restructuring. The third helps us to understand how the system collapsed. And there are two elements most people don't talk about anymore that helped to unravel the Soviet Union. The first, and this is in line with the Leninist principle, the law on unearned incomes. What was the problem with the Soviet Union? People are too greedy and they're too capitalistic. So we now require, in order to buy any consumer goods, like a dishwasher, or well they didn't have those, a washing machine, or a car, you have to document that the money you used was earned in your state job at 360 rubles per month. And you're buying a 7,000 ruble item. This had a hugely harmful impact on the economy because this uh, economy in the shadows that was really working now received a very damaging blow. Anyone who had accumulated any money couldn't spend it. I've got all this money, but it clearly was because I do these deals on the side. And therefore, I can't spend it. And people began examining, why are you buying these th things on the salary that you have? The other was, well, why is it that we cannot match the West? It's because we're all drunk. <laughs> and it is known, the Russians in particular have a, a more of a drinking problem than some other nations, let's just put it that way. Uh, and it is a very serious issue to this day, partly exacerbated by communism, but in a way they did not understand. Gorbachev ordered the reduction of alcohol production well, they didn't understand something. Alcohol was a major source of revenue of the state. And they didn't know that. So if you look at the numbers, 1984, these are in billions of rubles, 36.7 billion rubles just from alcohol sales, down to 27 and then 29. The percentage of the state budget this is quite a blow that was absolutely unanticipated and unintended. They did not know the state lived from vodka production. <laughs> and it, I recall in the Soviet Union, you go into a restaurant, they give you these giant menus, that, and you, I learned very quickly, there's no point asking for all the things. He said, do you have this? I said, mm, not today, maybe later. Well, do you have this? Uh, we're sold out. What about this? Mm, sorry. You go down the list, finally you just, you don't look at the menu, you just say, what do you have? They say, we have borscht. Fine, I'll have borscht. <laughs> and then the question was, what would you like to drink? They say, well, do you have uh, vodka minerali? Yeah, we don't have mineral water. Do you have sock? Do you have juice? Sorry, not, not now. I say, okay. What do you have? We have vodka. I say, okay, I'd like a big glass of vodka with my breakfast. <laughs> Just, just what I want is vodka. So that, that's what they had. Beer was absolutely unattainable. And a friend of mine, Ed Dolan, you may know Ed, very fine economist, actually tracked down. He went to the beer breweries and followed the trucks because there's never any beer for sale. They'd go to a corner, they'd meet people, and here's how it worked. They'd exchange the beer for money much more than the official price of the beer. So it's like, 
half a ruble for the beer, they'd sell it for four rubles. Then the beer truck would go to the store and get a receipt, he delivered the thousand bottles of beer, but he doesn't have any beer, he sold them all. He'd get the receipt and the money. Then he'd buy them all back. So he'd give to the, the beer store manager the money, then they'd split the difference. That's how it worked. So you couldn't get a beer unless you knew who, with whom you should speak. So this was a really serious problem for the state and led to what was called the soft budget constraint. The state did not have the money they anticipated, so they printed it. They went and said, well, we'll advance through the state bank credits to you, to all of your productive enterprises to pay wages and so on. The state doesn't have any money. That meant massive inflation in an economy with no free prices. The price of everything was still fixed. They couldn't rise. Everyone has a lot of money. They created what was called the ruble overhang. Everyone had money and there's nothing to buy. But you had more money than you could imagine. And one thing was quite interesting to use a telephone booth required a two kopeck coins. There were 100 kopecks in a ruble. So you think, okay, so you just get a two kopeck coin. Except it's actually a little coin. So to buy a two kopeck coin would cost you, like, I don't know, remember, 40 rubles. <laughs> because you couldn't use the rubles in the machine. You had to have a two kopeck coin. It was effectively just a token. But the state phone company still received only two kopecks. They couldn't turn around and sell two kopeck coins for 40 rubles. So you just see the, the way in which this lack of a pricing system generated problems. The ruble collapsed on the international markets. Now the rest of the story is probably fairly well known to you. Economic collapse, shortages, very serious food crises. It is hard to describe how awful it was. It was awful. You'd go to a city in the Soviet Union, the door would open, and the first words the stewardess would say was, do you have bread? This is in the great Soviet empire. Do you have bread? Was the question. I spent time in a number of countries, and I remember I was in Bulgaria, the last day at the university they had food. It's hard to imagine. I had lovely, so to speak, lunch, with a professor who had been a student of Professor F.A. Harper, founder of the Institute for Humane Studies, by the way, many years ago, and he remembered him. Yeah, he was a big free market guy. Should have listened to him. <laughs> I then went with a group of students to a seminar. The food was so horrifying, it was slippery with bacteria, and I really hate vomiting in front of my hosts. <laughs> Rude. So I was overcome with nausea, staggered out, because throwing up in front of them is bad form, fell to my knees outside and threw up. Unfortunately, it turns out it was in front of the big window of the cafeteria. So they're all staring at me as I was heaving the horrifying uh, food that they had. And that was, uh, it was really pretty bad. Various republics from the Soviet Union declared their independence, the Baltics and others. There was the putsch of 1991 against Gorbachev, those who said, we will restore the Soviet system, we will bring back order. They printed 300,000 arrest forms and produced a quarter of a million handcuffs. So they were serious. This was going to bring it back. And it failed. Boris Yeltsin, uh, the famous tank in Moscow, uh, saying he would, was willing to die to stop that from happening. Gorbachev resigned December 25th, and the next day, on the 26th, the USSR was officially declared uh, dissolved, which is really a great day, but it was a period of enormous crisis, and it is hard, again, to recapture just what it was like at that time. I'll conclude with uh, some thoughts just on some new challenges that we face, and Mises has some interesting thoughts on these. Number one, our welfare states are facing serious bankruptcy. The unfunded liabilities are staggering, much greater than the official debt. 
People focus on government debt. It is about one-seventh in the U.S. of the total indebtedness of the American federal government, not counting states and localities. As California knows something about that uh, also. Uh, fiscal imbalances that are stunning, that would require massive confiscations of wealth just to finance the gap between tax revenue and required expenditures. The threat of nationalism, statism, protectionism, fascism, and war. And I do think fascism is coming back as a political threat to liberty. We're seeing it across Europe. The current government of Russia could be properly designated a fascist state. There are a number of fascist states and movements. The government of Hungary, Viktor Orban, authoritarian one-party state. Uh, and unfortunately, the main opposition party to the fascist government of Hungary is the Jobbik, which is a Nazi party. So that's just to cheer you up uh, about that situation. But our friends in Hungary are working very hard against that. That's the topic of two of my other books. I hope you'll take the chance to get copies. They're intended to be readable. You don't have to read it all. It's not a chore. If you read one essay, that's all you want to read, that's fine. We distribute these all around the world and in multiple languages. The morality of capitalism is, I just got the Amharic and Ukrainian editions in, so it's about 40 different languages, and these are coming out in others as well. Thank you for your attention. Q and A. Yeah, I'd be happy Would to, like to uh, share thoughts. Ask Tom some uh, questions about uh, his talk or whatever. I'll leave Go it ahead. up to you. Go ahead. Right there. Yes, sir. So I, I heard stories about you smuggling in copies of uh, books to uh, Russia question. in the days when it was dangerous to do so. And what what kind of efforts are being made to get into Iran and the Middle Eastern countries with the free market? So the question was about introducing these ideas into behind the Iron Curtain. And then today, what efforts are being made in countries that are suffering from various forms of authoritarian or totalitarian rule, Iran and, and elsewhere. Uh, I was never at much risk because as a foreigner, I was arrested but normally talk my way out of it because I'm just that kind of person. <laughs> and, and I learned don't ever sign anything, never sign anything, never, 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 never put your name on anything. Uh, and be absolutely adamant about what you are doing is, is absolutely authorized and correct and there will be problems for these people if they continue to give you a hard time. So <laughs> the worst that would happen to me was I would be expelled. Other people were at much greater risk, and many of them had suffered in the past. Terrible, terrible fates. I remember in Poland once, in uh, Lublin, I uh, spoke at the faculty there, and the ending days of communism before solidarity had won, and it was really quite moving. I learned a lot of things. I was at the Urania Hotel, which is a state-run hotel, and I learned one thing. The Polish state was financing itself as a whorehouse. I was, the, I think, the only guest who was not there to have sex with Polish women, which was organized by the Polish government, who brought in plane loads on the Polish state airlines from the Middle East of men who thought it would be great to have sex with Polish women. And this was all a state enterprise. It was really, it was really eye opening. I said, well, that's one way to run a totalitarian system. Uh, and by the way, Cuba does this also with underage kids, state sponsored sex tourism. It's just despicable and horrifying and should strip away any sense that these people have any, any moral superiority to a green grocer or uh, uh, executive at a software company or anyone like that trying to make a living. These people are disgusting, just disgusting. Uh, but also, uh, I, 
invited people to dinner. And it turns out at this hotel, it was less than $3 a night to have dinner. And so everybody came. And to me, that wasn't very much money. It was actually a lot of money for them. I asked the chairwoman of the faculty, a wonderful, distinguished scholar and great lady, I said, in my thoughtless way, so do you come here often? This is a nice hotel, nice, well, whorehouse, but nice restaurant. <laughs> and uh, she says, oh, no, 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 we, no, this is, you might come here on your 25th wedding anniversary. This is very expensive. So that was a little humbling for me, just a couple dollars. But for them, it was a 25th wedding anniversary restaurant. And at the dinner, everyone, they, she introduced every person. This is Professor so-and-so. He was imprisoned under the Nazis. He was tortured. He was in labor camp. Then he got out and was teaching again. Then he was imprisoned by the communists. He was in, put in labor camp. He was tortured. And he was just imprisoned again recently, but was let out and we're happy he's here with us. So just going down the line, really not part of my life experience. Um, so there were lots of people who really suffered because they would not break. And I, I mentioned again Professor Mao Yushur in China, who's a great human being. I am so full of admiration of him. He's a great champion of liberty, a great economist, and they never broke him. When he was imprisoned in the early 50s, he suffered during the Great Leap Forward, nearly starved to death, was in the last stages of starvation. It's a very bad way to die, by the way. Uh, he, uh, was punished during the Cultural Revolution and he never, never gave up. His first arrest was when they seized his private diary and found he had written, if there's no pork in the market, they should let the price rise. So for that, he was condemned and imprisoned. In regards to other countries, there are many activities uh, currently underway. Uh, it's very difficult. And uh, Iran has a quite effective internet uh, blocking system. Uh, so it's, it's not something that most of us can be involved in, but there are libertarians in other countries who have easier access. And I should point out some of my books are available in Persian. And this was a pleasant surprise that they made it past the very difficult censorship system. Uh, to get in, so it, it's, it can be done. Uh, but one has to approach these areas with great sensitivity and great care and caution. And I have many Iranian colleagues, and I always defer to their judgment as to what, what they think is safe, acceptable. And I'm always very concerned that I do not expose other people to risk, because you, you can hurt other people very badly if you're thoughtless. Uh, in China, we have many partners. They're very, very active in that country, despite internet blocking and so on as well. And uh, extraordinarily brave, thoughtful, systematic, strategic thinkers who want to move their country forward to become wealthy, free, rule of law, peaceful nation. So these are, these are really uh, remarkable people. And if you want to know more about it, go to atlasnetwork.org. Look under our directory, we have many partners all around the world, um, and you could find out really remarkable stories of, of very, very brave people promoting these. And last one I'll mention in Arabic, we started a project when I was at Cato and moved to Atlas in 2009 to promote the ideas of liberty in the Arabic language. It was almost totally absent, and our colleagues are extremely brave. They've just done seminars in Yemen, so promoting libertarian ideas in Yemen is not so easy under the current situation. They're very active throughout the region and they are quite committed and they say, they look at what's happening in Iraq and Syria, this Islamic state, they say we do not want to be ruled by savages and thugs and barbarians. And ultimately the United States can send all the F-16s they want that will not defeat them has to be us. We have to beat them and we have to beat them in the hearts of our people by showing them there is a different way. A way of toleration and living together peacefully and that's what they do 
and books, internet. So you can, we have a number of websites in Arabic you could visit also. Yeah. Way, way, way in the back. I had a conversation with the people about that, and uh, um, if you ever want to go to North Korea, I'll, I'll, we'll talk and I'll tell you how to do it. Red stamp. Um, red stamp helps. <laughs> also, I'll, I'll mention one other thing. The guides, minders, spies who are with you, they're not bad people. They grow up in a, a terrible situation. They may be believers in that system. I, I don't know. There's just no way to know what they think, what they really think. I have no clue. Maybe they're absolutely committed. Maybe not. But they don't have any choice. And I don't want to do anything that would be harmful to them, right? To cause them embarrassment. And there are lots of ways you can do that. And I don't want to do that to these people who are innocent. Even that guy, the picture of him, at the at the border that's his job he was born in that society he doesn't know anything else and he made a point of threatening people he said do you think there'll be nuclear war with the united states it's an interesting question because we're certainly ready for it and we know we can survive it what do you think so he, that's what he's told to say send back the message right but i don't know what he thinks i don't know what's in his heart and this is something they used to say at the uh, Berlin Wall. When you see the guards and you, they frighten you, remember that guy who jumped over the wall. And there are many guards who escaped. You don't know what they're really thinking because they're also afraid. So you have to be very sensitive to these circumstances to work with people and, and learn how not to endanger them needlessly and not to hate them. I didn't hate communist officials in the Soviet Union by and large either. They were born there. They didn't set that system up. Most of them in some other society would have been okay. They were just corrupt. They were schmucks. Um, but I didn't hate them for it because they were not responsible for having been born in such an evil system. I hope that it's a little helpful. Yes, ma'am. I understand everything was falling apart internally, and that might have precipitated the mass of people that went to the wall at that one point in time, where before they could never congregate in those numbers. What was the rumor? What, what was the catalyst that without cell phones or anything else, they ended up massing and realizing there were more of them than the guards. Well, there are two things. Uh, one, on that particular night, there was a rumor because of a kind of a misstatement by one of the party spokesmen on television. There was a rumor that the wall was open. People said, let's go. And it wasn't. And the guards hadn't gotten any orders. And suddenly, thousands and thousands and thousands of people start to show up. Just a misstatement. <laughs> was a miscommunication. <laughs> Let's put it that way. And, but then the rumor got out and everyone told all their friends, did you hear, did you hear? It's open, let's go. And then they just pushed their way through and the guards didn't know what to do. And they didn't, they didn't know how to react. And they kept calling, what are we supposed to do? And no one answered. And it just it became a fait accompli, as they say in California. <laughs> the other thing was the most, subversive slogan was not down with communism, it was auf die Straße, onto the streets. And what happened was, some people started to demonstrate in Dresden and other cities. And they kept saying, come join us, come join us. Because if there's only 100 of you, they'll beat you up and, and drag you off. So if there's 150, it'll be a little harder. 500, they'll have to use deadly force. And I'm not clear they want to do that. When half of the population of the city is marching 
and everyone is out there. They couldn't do anything. It was just overwhelming. So that was the most important thing was overcoming the free rider problem. If it's just me, they'll beat me out. John and I, they'll beat us up. Well, maybe not, John's tough. <laughs> but when it's half of the population, they can't beat you up anymore. And that really was what led to its downfall, the realization there are more of us than there are of you. And as a consequence, it failed. Last point, states learn. Mr. Putin is an uh, absolute fascist. There's no question as to what he has evolved into. He wasn't years ago. He has an ideology of Eurasianism, fascism, great Russia, gathering the Russian lands. It's what I call failed empire syndrome. We had a great empire and the world feared us, and now they don't. They will learn again. This happened before, by the way. This is the, what happened in Germany. We lost our empire and we will get it back, and they will fear us again. What they do is they know the local police won't beat people to death, so they bring in the Oman, the professional beaters, and they fly them in. This is how they put down riots, and this is what the Chinese authorities do. Tiananmen Square, those were not local Chinese policemen or soldiers, they were units from the countryside brought in to beat up a bunch of hippie college, pinko, faggot, queer college students. Wouldn't you like to do that? And that's what they did, because the locals won't do it. They live there. And so they, these states also learn, and one has to adapt to those circumstances also. That's what's happening in Hong Kong right now. There's a face-off between the Hong Kong students and their parents and the central authorities. We'll see how that turns out. What do you think? Thank you very much, sir.